Hello, we are In Conversation with the Sanford School, a podcast from the School of Social and Family Dynamics at Arizona State University. Designed to showcase timely and informative insights from leading faculty, researchers, and other experts, which impact the ever-changing world we live in. Here at the Sanford School, we recognize that the lands where we are hosting this conversation at Arizona State University, belong to the Maricopa and Pima peoples. And we are privileged to be here to welcome you to today's conversation. In today's podcast, we're excited to be in conversation with our special guests to discuss FAS 410, working with military families, a course designed to help students understand and serve the needs of the military family and students. Our guests today include Jennifer Brome, lead instructor of FAS 410 from ASU's School of Social and Family Dynamics, and Jeff Gimmerin, director of ASU's Pat Tillman Veteran Center. Our host of today's podcast is Lisa Barth, Academic Success Advisor Coordinator from ASU's School of Social and Family Dynamics. Guests, welcome to the podcast and take it away, Lisa. Good afternoon, welcome. Uh, I'm excited to spend some time getting to know a little bit more about this course. Uh, As an academic advisor at ASU, one of my main responsibilities is to recommend courses uh, that I think are a good match for students. And so getting this information um, from those that teach it uh, is gonna be very helpful in me sharing this with our students. Um, Before we start, I just wanna have a chance to get to know a little bit more about uh, each of our panelists. So Jennifer, if you wouldn't mind just starting by telling us a little bit about your role at ASU and your involvement. Thank you, Lisa. Hi, Jeff. Um, I am uh, an an instructor with the uh, school and have been with ASU for close to 19 years now. Uh, And actually, I'm a graduate of Arizona State from uh, undergraduate through my graduate work. So I am a true sun devil. And I'm also a person that was a military wife for over 20 years. And so uh, I feel that uh, I had some great experience to share with our students. And so anyway, that's, uh, I'm a mom and a grandma. And anyway, so thank you for asking. Awesome. Jeff? Yeah, thanks Lisa. And and thanks for the invitation to do this podcast. so I, I know Jennifer from, uh, from a previous time where I was here, uh, but uh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, I am a uh, uh, Air Force veteran. I completed 25 years of service, actually retired from active duty the first part of June of this year, uh, and uh, have uh, spent a lot of time all around the globe uh, in a variety of different assignments and so forth. But one of my favorite assignments was actually my tie and link back to ASU was uh, back in 2016 timeframe. I was the commander of the Air Force ROTC detachment here at ASU. So when uh, I I unfortunately had to leave, the Air Force uh, decided I needed to move on and I didn't want to go. So uh, had a lot of plans in place to try to figure out ways to get back here and and fortunately uh, was able to land position here at, at the Pat Tillman Veterans Center when the predecessor, Steve Borden, had moved on to bigger and better things. And so excited to be here uh, and especially working with Jennifer because during my time back in uh, ROTC here, uh, we did work together on a variety of things and I had some of her students actually in some of my courses. So we had a good relationship and I'm glad to continue that now. Awesome. Thanks to both of you for that introduction and thanks Jeff for your service. Uh, So I think to get started, I'm going to pose a question to Jennifer. Um, Jennifer, tell us why this course? Well, actually, the course sort of organically started. Um, I teach family classes within the school, and one of the classes was marriage and family. 
And I started just bringing a lecture. I felt like it was, we were gonna talk about family, we needed to include military families. And I started to just inject the lecture. And then the next thing I knew, I had students in my office asking me more questions about it. Uh, I also then started, I got an invitation uh, from then Lieutenant Colonel Halleck in the Air Force ROTC. He invited me to come and teach in their leadership class about the importance of uh, commanders understanding the family dynamics that were also played a role. And somehow I became a little bit more involved with ROTC, their success program. And as a reciprocal, I started to invite them to my class. And then the students kept asking for more and more and more. And so I thought that since we taught family, it was a good idea maybe to look at uh, the military family because certainly it fit in both family and sociology. And uh, so then I started to do focus groups with students. And as I said, it sort of organically sort of uh, formed itself. And then the hard work became because uh, the academic Senate didn't really care necessarily about how organically they wanted, you know, the nuts and bolts of it. So then serious uh, consideration and work began. And I started working with Dr. Fabes and Dr. Spinrad and started to look at the data and the statistical information. Great, that's, that's helpful. Um, also, if you wouldn't mind telling me a little bit about um, maybe insight that you hope to provide for those students who are not part of a military family, what could they get out of this course? Well, I think what's one of the things that has become clearer is the fact that once the military started to become a volunteer service, there started to be less and less connection. And, you know, as I got older and the students got younger, it was not that, oh, I have an uncle in the military. Oh, you know, we did this with, uh, we were a military family. So it became a larger gap between understanding. And then we, I started to have veterans in the classroom. And a lot of them were coming to me in my office saying, you know, I don't feel this connection with the students because they don't really understand a lot that goes on in my family dynamics. And that was either with their parents, uh, their time away, their separation, you know, because they were in the military, there was a time gap between what the students who were not in the military were doing. So this became uh, something to consider. And then, uh, so I really hope communication and to start respecting and to ask questions and gain some of the sacrifices that the family make. I, you know, I hope that we understand the service that the actual members of the service do and that their primary goal is whatever mission they're given. But because that is a primary goal, it has to be okay with the family too, which means for children, they sometimes miss Christmases, maybe their dads or moms can't coach something. Uh, and then the moves and just one short little story, which, you know, I think is important. We moved my daughter in the middle of her sophomore year, actually before it was even the middle of her sophomore year. And so, for the move, we actually took her away from a school she loved, a boyfriend, and cheerleading. And it was a real sacrifice for her. And when we got to the new place, because there was a mixture of military families and civilian families, they understood. But had we gone to a place uh, where there had not been any military families, I'm not sure that they would have understood why she was grieving like she was and it had nothing to do with her not being proud of her father 
So that's what I really hope to increase the understanding, to increase through that increase of understanding the, the kindness and the understanding and the support. And then the final thing is all of these young men and women are going to be voters. And uh, we need people to understand why monies need to be allocated through voting to the military, but also to the family, to have the family resources available for uh, all of the families, especially the children, making sure that they have activities and support since they can be brought anywhere, including overseas. Yeah, and, and so that's, it's an important part of, you know, even more so than just the students within our own degrees in sociology and family and human development, across all of ASU and all of the, the majors that they will have future careers working potentially with veterans and, and folks that have been in military families that having this background information would help. And also, you know, as they make decisions for um, themselves and their family through the voting process. So yeah, that's, that's huge. Absolutely, uh, that's why we set it up as an interdiscipline uh, elective for everyone. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, a question for Jeff now. Um, part of the course description talks about um, an increased understanding. Uh, so what does that really mean for active military, National Guard, or veterans um, interacting with the student population? Yeah, so a great question, Lisa, and, and I'll tie a, a little bit of this to uh, what Jennifer just laid out in terms of uh, her description of, of the course and, and why she did it. Uh, uh, fundamentally, it is critical that we continue to pursue some, some attempt and semblance of trying to reduce the civilian and military gap and figuring out how, how to lessen those, how to get us closer together, and, and that, that kind of has many different facets to it. Uh, first and foremost is we, we need to better understand each other's culture. And, and, and Jennifer just kind of laid out some great examples of the differences in those cultures in that uh, one is the, the military moves around constantly and is, is constantly uprooted with the family and, and shifted. And I, I, I'll give you my own experience in 25 years I moved uh, a dozen times. So it was about every uh, 2.25 years or so I was on the move. Uh, a portion of at the beginning, I was single and it didn't impact anybody other than me. But then when my wife and I got married uh, before children, it, it had a, a huge impact on uh, her professional development, what she wanted to do in, in her future. Uh, and it was all linked basically to, uh, to me and and we were at the mercy of Air Force personnelists trying to figure out where we were going to go around the globe. Uh, and then, of course, when we had children, that was a whole nother shift in, in terms of the, uh, the, the impacts and the consequences. So that culture is, is there are some similarities on the civilian side, certainly in probably some of the corporate world uh, examples, but it is still unique and, and it is vastly different than the majority of what other American citizens face in terms of, of what they do with, with their lives and their careers. So understanding those dynamics and that culture uh, is, is critical. And so the more we can get that understanding and, and bring it together, the better. Uh, Jennifer and I have also chatted before about, and she alluded to kind of the differences between a student veteran <laughs> and or a military active duty guard reservist who is attending college. Uh, and, and then the typical general population of, of a civilian student. And, and there, there are incredible uh, vast differences between the approach of a lot of these uh, uh, two sides because of, of the, the different backgrounds that they come from. Uh, right now for our demographic within the uh, ASU enterprise and all our campuses uh, and what, what I oversee in the Pat Tillman Veterans Centers, we have uh, over 10,500 military affiliated students. And the average age of that group is a little over 30 years old. And so take that and compare it to what the average age is for the, uh, the typical student uh, that, that doesn't have that background or that experience. 
and that's a that's a 10 to 12 year difference in terms of uh, experiences, perspectives, and, and so forth. So that is a another huge disconnect, and that and that really shapes a lot of those interactions uh, that they have on campus and and in the local community as well. So. My goal uh, in, the, in the Pat Tillman Veteran Center, or one of the, the primary ones, is to figure out how can we lessen and, and minimize that civil military gap to get that better understanding and, and have an impact to shape uh, a lot of what Jennifer mentioned is, is the civic duties, uh, the, the, the basic responsibilities they have in that regard. Also, the cultures and bringing them closer together and understanding why a service member does what they do uh, and, and they all have very different reasons. It could be patriotism, it could be financial situation, it could just be wanting to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And uh, for others outside of that scope and, and outside of that category to understand why they do it is critical because that can lead to a conflict down the road if we don't have some better understanding and empathy kind of, of, of that perspective. And I'll, I'll close it with as well, how important it is to, to, to do the other side is for military members and, and veterans to have that perspective as well as that the civilian side looks at things very differently. And so the more we can learn together in a course like Jennifer has set up, uh, the better, because when we, when we talk and we, we, we create an empathetic environment and an understanding environment, and, and work through those issues, we're going to be better in the end, at, at least from my perspective. Awesome. If I may, I'd like to add one thing on to what Jeff said, because although it sort of sounds funny, it's really critical. I actually had two students in my class that were engaged to two of Jeff's ROTC cadets, and they were taking the course, I think, for really a really very positive reason. They wanted to understand what the culture was like that they were marrying into. They did not have any relationship with any service member. They met the two cadets on ASU campus, dated and it was their senior year, and they had gotten engaged. And I thought, I had met with them privately and what a responsible, uh, individual to, to want to learn more about a life that they were entering. And so they wanted, and they met in my office to find out my perspective as a military wife, what it was like, but what a great gift they gave the person that they were marrying to want to really understand so they could support the uh, life at the ROTC and they were both starting in the beginning because anyone who will tell you that was the second lieutenant, it was a new experience and not necessarily one that they had the thought of the first day they were commissioned. So, so that's important too. And, and, and I'm glad you brought that story up, Jennifer, because not only is it a gift to who they were engaged to and, and about to to, to walk into a future with in, in the military life. But the more informed they are as, as a spouse, when they integrate into the, whatever military installation they're gonna be assigned to and whatever community they're in, they're better informed and better prepared so that they can also lead in, 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 in many respects in that community that they're walking into. Because the, we, we all know humanity and not everybody is as well prepared as that. And so a lot of spouses get into that environment and they hit a wall really quick. And so when you have people out there that you can reach out to and talk to and, and, and get some, some help from, that's huge. And I, I will say the military across all the service branches does a, a really good job in trying to throw a lot of those resources out there. Uh, there is a lot of unwillingness in some cases for family members to utilize those resources for whatever stigma is associated with, hey, I don't want to, I don't want to go get counseling. I don't want to go get help. I don't want to have to look weak uh, and, and, and be perceived as somebody that's needy or, or dependent on others. 
Uh, but but there are some that, that do latch into that and, and take full advantage of it and, and all points in between. So when you have a variety of different ways to respond in those environments with, it could be spouses that are well-informed like Jennifer mentioned, uh, even more important, her program and the certification that it offers, creating individuals that have the expertise to understand the, the impacts of a military life on the family and getting more of those folks out into positions where they can do that professionally is, is another huge uh, benefit. And, and I would love to see more of, of those kind of counseling services rolled out there to where you could take advantage of them uh, if, if they're uh, available. Thank you. Yes, so so important on both sides, military and non-military, for you know this information to to be shared. So that's great. I, I think we really touched on my final question here, but maybe I could just ask for your your top recommendation, each of you in this area, um, because I'm not from a military family, um, and, and both of you are. Um, what would be what would you think is your top thing that you would like for others to know? Um, that are not from a military family? Um, from my standpoint, one, I, I think that um, individuals need to know that from all of the military families that I have interacted with, and certainly after uh, 20 years, I've, I've met a few, uh, very strong very, very strong uh, individuals, especially the spouses, and we can't just say wives anymore because there's a lot of uh, husbands that are civilians married to military women. Um, I think children become very resilient uh, and uh, they have to be because of the fact that you move. I think uh, our family, up Jeff won on a move because we did 13 moves in 20 years and two overseas. And that and also included some uh, uh, unaccompanied tours uh, for Bill. And so, uh, and I, I think that that's probably something that I would want people to know that military families are usually very engaged in communities and uh, are, are strong leaders within themselves, but also make a lot of sacrifices. And I think we forget about that, that sometimes the military, I mean, I can tell you as a second lieutenant's wife, my first major sacrifice, because our first tour was in Germany, so I don't think I can call that a sacrifice, is uh, my daughter was two weeks old and he went on reforger and was gone for two months. So uh, and I was in a you know, strange com company, young and country and young and a new baby. And, uh, but the military community came together and I made some of my best friends there. And uh, so I think that's what they need to do. And I think that they also need to recognize what an honorable uh, job it is that, that the people in the service and their families are supporting and, uh, and they're doing it for love of country. And or else you, you wouldn't, you would go get a corporate job. If you're going to move, go get a corporate job. But this is because we believe in the country and our, our democracy. And I think that that's important for people to remember. Yeah, I, I can uh, add a couple of things on there to what Jennifer mentioned. And, uh, and, and I think one theme that is, is always uh, the constant and, and it's chaos. And, and so throughout your career, uh, for the most part, if there, there are gonna be some that, that do four to six years and, and, and they punch out and they've done their, their service and, and everything's good. They didn't, they didn't have that bumpy ride in that case because they just weren't in long enough to, to have the, the, the impacts like we're talking with 20 and 25 year careers. 
but for those that, that do the long haul, uh, the, the, the key word is chaos and, and just expect it. And so that, that's important for, I think, non-military uh, experienced folks to understand is that, that we are in a constant state of chaos. And uh, like I mentioned, and, and Jennifer as well, we never know where our next assignment's gonna be until usually uh, four or five months at best, if, if that's the case. But throw on top of that deployments, uh, I was deployed uh, at one point when my wife and I uh, were first together and uh, we, <laughs> the, the circumstance was we were about to move from an apartment in one town, uh, same installation to a, another location in, uh, in another town nearby. And we had plans, I had already uh, got the truck loaded or the truck set up and rented and, and we were going to use that weekend to uh, shift everything over. And uh, oh, by the way, September 11th happened uh, about three days before that occurred. And I was one of the first wave deployments going to the Middle East in, in that response. So I had 40, 48 hours notice to get my stuff together and, and, and go across the globe and into the circumstance. My wife was left with, okay, now I got to move this entire house to another location because we'd already started the rent on the new one and the other one was terminating. And so kind of a panic set in as, as expected because of the chaos again. Uh, and, and you never know what's going to happen. Fortunately, my work center at, at the base and my boss, they all jumped in and those that, that were not deploying, they spent that weekend with my wife moving her. And so we, we were resilient, we were flexible, and we had the help of our, our, our military community. And I'm sure if, if I'd had civilian friends in that area, I'm, there's no doubt they would have chipped in and helped as well. But I use that story to illustrate is you just never know what's gonna happen. And, and it can happen with a, with a couple of days notice. Uh, sometimes you have a little bit more time to plan and, and that causes a lot of frustration. It causes a lot of worry, it causes a lot of angst. And, and, and the military member themselves is usually focused on the mission and, and what they got to do to work through those processes to get things going. And, and where the splash effect is, is, is hitting heavily is on the family members, the, 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 the spouse, the children, and, and anyone else that's dependent. I mean, throw in the pets too, because they get yanked around as well. And so when, you're, when you have that, that unknown and that chaos all the time, that can cause a, a lot of uh, frictions. It can cause a lot of uh, frustrations. And if everybody kind of understands a little bit better of, of how that works, they'll understand maybe down the road how they could potentially help when, when they come across those circumstances. And it's not always a full frontal assault to say, hey, we're, I'm gonna jump in here. Thank you for your service. Let's, let's go fix this for you. It, that, that can't be the, the, the fix all situation all the time. There may be some nuance and some different approaches that you have to take. And so the better educated you are on, on those circumstances that, that they face, the better you can kind of help and prepare in that regard. I would like to add to that for military family though, there also are amazing experiences that you know you may not have in another area. I know my students love when I tell stories, especially our stories about when we were with NATO. But the uh, but you do and your children have an experience, you know, the world because of, the, of being able. And I think that the one thing that of the experience, I mean, we made great friends who are with us, you know, 40 now, 50 years. And uh, the one experience, though, that I will remember no matter what is we were invited to a dinner while we were at NATO with the French mission and uh, the French general who is the head of whatever the, the French mission, uh, I was seated next to him and he asked me if I knew French and I said a tiny bit, but I answered him in French. Well, big mistake. He quizzed me. He would hold up the salt and pepper shaker and say, what's this? 
all night, all I did was take a vocabulary test in French. And, but it was one of the best nights of my life too, because who can say that you were quizzed by a French general? <laughs> and so I have to admit there are, you know, there are aspects of a military family life that um, you can't, you can't trade. There, there are great avenues. And I think that's important for other individuals to know as well. Yeah, that, that, that's a great example, Jennifer. And, and, and I have one similar too, is uh, my wife and I, we were living in Ramstein Air Base, Germany, uh, which is in the Southwest corner of, of, of Germany itself, not far from the French border. And what we really, uh, we were thinking about it not long ago was uh, Sunday morning, we could wake up and say, hey, uh, you feel like some, getting some French bread? Sure, well, let's go to France and get the French bread. So. We drove across the border, went to a bakery, got our French bread and, and, and baguettes and brought it back. And, and, and to your point, uh, a lot of people don't get those experiences. They don't, they don't get to see those cultures. They don't get to see those, those perspectives of others uh, in the international community. And, and that really does lend itself to, to helping people understand each other a little bit better. I think it encourages empathy and, uh, and it kind of takes you beyond what, what a typical American just, just never gets to see. And, and that's neat uh, and a great experience. Well, thank you to both of you. Um, the wealth of information that you provided was very helpful. And um, I've learned quite a bit just in the short 15 minutes here um, I can't imagine all of the information that they'll get a chance to learn about in the class. Um, thank you for all of the um, experiences and knowledge that you bring to those uh, students in that class. Um, and I, I think that will do it for today. Well, thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Lisa, too, because uh, we advisors and so uh, you're one of our best support systems so thank you so much for all you do yeah thanks lisa appreciate the opportunity fas 410 is offered each fall semester and is open to majors of all disciplines there are no prerequisites unless you are working toward the optional certificate Past students have included many affiliated with human development, sociology, social work, criminal justice, gender studies, nursing, education, psychology, and ROTC. If you would like to connect with today's podcast guest, please email the following. Lisa.barth at asu.edu for Lisa Barth, m.brome that's B-R-O-U-G-H-A-M at ASU.edu for Jennifer Brome. And J-G-U-I-M-A-R-I at ASU.edu for Jeff Gimmerin. Connect with us and get access to all of our podcasts by visiting the Sanford School.asu.edu forward slash podcast, where you will also find links to all of our social media channels. This conversation has come to an end, but our work here continues.